In this lecture, we'll look at the history of China from roughly the 15th to the early 19th centuries. As always, it's important to reflect on the reasons for such an examination. In the case of China, it's pretty obvious. Economically and politically, China's growing importance is quite likely to make the 21st century a Chinese century. So it's imperative that we understand China's past to better appreciate Sino-American relations in the present. Let's start with the two empires that created the foundations of modern China, namely the Ming and Qing dynasties. Here are maps that show their boundaries. The Ming dynasty lasted from 1368 to 1644, and the Qing dynasty held the imperial throne from 1644 until 1911, when a revolution ended Qing rule. Taken together, these two dynasties span over 500 years, yet they're just a sliver of Chinese history when taken in its totality. Keep in mind that China has a recorded history that goes back over 2,000 years to the Qin dynasty, where our word China originates. As we examine Chinese history, you'll acquire a sense of its enormity and how the Chinese perceive it. With empires coming and going, rising and falling, there developed in China the view that history is a vast cycle, with China literally in its middle. Hence the notion that China is the middle kingdom or center of civilization, the axis about which everything else revolves. This Sinocentric perspective is what the Chinese adopted when looking at outsiders, whom they contemptuously deemed Si Yi, or barbarians. The social and moral basis of Chinese culture, as well as a key to understanding its history, is the philosophy known as Confucianism, which consists of several fundamentally humanistic beliefs. The first is the belief known as Xiao, which we can translate as loyalty to one's parents, but also fidelity and respect for elders, ancestors, and older siblings. In other contexts, we would refer to filial piety, the obligation that sons and daughters feel toward their parents. Confucianism also extended xiao to include loyalty to the state, exemplified at the highest level by the emperor's responsibility to rule wisely and rule well. If the emperor lost that ability or lost the willingness to rule wisely and well, then the dynasty would endanger itself and its citizens. The Chinese sought to see their culture, their history, and their state as embodiments of loyalty, tradition, social responsibility, and moral integrity. The phrase scholar-bureaucrat is something that one sees frequently in discussions of Chinese history, often in the context of Confucianism. The scholar-bureaucrats were civil servants who had earned academic degrees by passing imperial examinations. Also known as mandarins, the scholar-bureaucrats adjudicated minor legal disputes, supervised community projects, adjudicated local laws, and oversaw Confucian ceremonies, as well as collecting taxes and expounding Confucian moral teachings. In many ways, the scholar bureaucrats were indispensable to the maintenance of Chinese society. The Ming government was, in many ways, a model of efficiency, perhaps because it had but one department, called the Secretariat, under the direct control of the Emperor. The Secretariat controlled six ministries, including the ministries of revenue, personnel, war, rights, public works, and justice. The Ministry of Personnel, what we might call human resources, was vital because it handled most matters relating to the staffing of the other ministries. Not surprisingly, it drew upon the most prestigious members of Chinese society, landowners and office holders, many of whom were the scholar bureaucrats we just introduced. The landowners, who were often farmers, 
derive their power from the agricultural value of their crops, as well as from the tax revenues they contributed to the state. Many of the office holders were literate. In particular, they were able to write since they possessed knowledge of calligraphy, which was essential to the record-keeping functions they were required to perform. However, just as important as literacy was their knowledge of Confucianism and their ability to apply it to the communities where their jurisdiction prevailed. It was principally these people, landowners and scholar bureaucrats, who were appointed to high positions in the state. One of the greatest Ming emperors, Yong Li, moved the Chinese capital from Nanjing to Beijing in 1421, where it remains to this day. He began construction of the seat of Chinese government, the ambitious set of buildings known as the Forbidden City. He strengthened the civil service examination based on Confucian texts, probably to increase his control over the scholar bureaucrats. He also extended the Great Wall and commissioned the Yong Li Encyclopedia, an enormous compendium of texts that included all that had been written on the Confucian canon, as well as all previous Chinese history, philosophy, arts, and sciences. It's one of the most remarkable achievements in Chinese cultural history. But perhaps the Emperor Yong Li is best known for his sponsorship of the naval expedition of an Admiral Zhong Ha. He undertook expeditions to Brunei, Java, Thailand, Southeast Asia, India, the Horn of Africa, and Arabia. At one point, the general commanded a fleet of more than 317 ships requiring almost 28,000 crewmen. The Chinese naval expeditions are fascinating episodes, not least because they are so poorly chronicled in Chinese history, and they cease so abruptly at a time during which naval power had global implications. After Zhong Ha's death in 1435, the expeditions mysteriously and abruptly ceased, never to return during Ming rule. Researchers suspect that the scholar bureaucrats at the emperor's court may have scuttled the Chinese navy as a means of eliminating an arm of government over which they had little control. Like much of Chinese history, it remains an enigmatic chapter. In our next lecture, we'll continue our examination of the Ming Dynasty. Until then, best wishes.